Hello everyone. So this is one of those interviews in English and uh, don't panic. It's really easy to switch on the subtitles so you will have the interview translated directly on YouTube with the subtitles. So I'm, I'm going to lead you on this process. It's really simple. You go to the little wheel down there and then you click on it and then on the parameters then you put the automatic translation and you put your language so this would be French probably and then you will have the interview with the French subtitles so it's not perfect but overall you you will have a general idea of well the interview subtitles in French Hello, uh, Linda. So uh, it's really wonderful to have you uh, as one of the speakers in this uh, online summit, Healing with Horses. And I'm, I'm really honored to, um, to have you here in this, in this summit. That's, that's wonderful. And um, we've been, uh, I've, I've been trained actually as an advanced instructor, and I've been um, facilitating uh, many workshops, many Point of Quest workshops also at your place and uh, and Linda um, well um, I think most of our um, our uh, spectators already know you uh, you are a writer you are the founder of the Eponoquest approach and um, you wrote the 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 Tao of Ecus of course and also this wonderful book the the way of the horse um, with uh, the the cards and um, unfortunately now it's it's not um, possible to have it in in french but i hope that it will be republished in the in the near future so um, yeah welcome welcome to this online summit well, it's always a pleasure to talk with you and spend time with you. You're one of my favorite instructors for sure. And, um, and I love where you've taken the work in your own unique way and all the work that you've done with the Native Americans and the spiritual side of the horse-human relationship. And I'm just thrilled to be here today. Thank you. And yes, the, there is definitely a spiritual aspect to this uh, relation with, with horses it's it's there is something really special it's it's almost spiritual and i know some people do not like this this word spiritual or spirit but there is something definitely special and uh, i remember i listened to um, an interview that you gave with um, isaac Rappertson, um the author of the horse boy um, and you were talking about um, Krishnamurti, the, 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 the mystic, the Hindu mystic. And, uh, and Krishnamurti said that um, the, his, his secret, his, his key um, in life is that he doesn't mind what is happening. And, and you were saying that with horse, it's about the same. So maybe you could... Um, um, develop a little bit. What, what do you mean with, with this, that the horse don't mind what is happening? 
Yes. Yeah, it was really fun to have that conversation with Rupert Isaacson. And um, I was really struck when I was researching the work by J. Krishnamurti, who was quite a marvelous author and mystic and lecturer in the 1900s. And as you mentioned, someone at one of his big lectures asked him, hey, what's the secret behind your life and your work? And, and he did say, well, the secret is I don't mind what's happening. And I thought, what a horse-like thing to say. And because that that is the sense of equanimity that horses have. And they have, you know, helped us fight wars on all possible sides. They have carried our burdens for us. They have served us in so many ways. And luckily now in the 21st century, when we don't need them so much as beasts of burden, although still people are, are showing and racing horses and things like that. But now is this potential with this work that we're all doing here where we let the horses be our guides and help us to learn some ways to balance the incredible intensity of the human race. I mean, humans are very dangerous. They're very bright, but they're also very dangerous. And we're often really acting in predatory ways toward members of our own species. And so I believe that having the horse as a primary companion along the way and a representative of what I call non-predatory power and non-predatory views of being in the world is essential to helping us balance our more aggressive tendencies. And so first of all, the idea that the horse doesn't mind what happens um, doesn't mean that they're, they're not, you know, able to grieve or experience pain or things like that. But they have this way of being present in the world with what's happening rather than trying to immediately change it to suit their own comfort. So they're really good. I mean, they, they don't live in caves. They don't store nuts for the winter. They move unprotected with the rhythms of the seasons. And there is this way that they can, you know, be having fun on a snowy morning and, and uh, wandering through the desert the Arabian horses and in incredible heat. And they just keep staying with all of the things that life has to offer and not always accepting it, but, but not trying to fight against it so much. And so I learned a lot from my horses of being more open to what's happening um, and also being, having that sense of equanimity. So, um, in fact, years ago, I was working with my horses and I was meditating with my horses and they were suggesting a game that they called all things equal. And it was this feeling of really being in the moment present with everything that was happening without making some kind of impulsive reaction to it or impulsive urge to control things. And so that's that's really what that means to me. Ooh. Is is that something to do with the the the, the concept of, of flow of being in the flow and and often the 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 athletes in sports say that that they they get the best results when they are in the flow. It, is that what what you mean with the the horse equanimity? Well. I mean, the flow state is one where you have a high level of, um, you know, where everything is feels like it's all lined up inside you and you're, you're working at an optimal level without a lot of resistance. And um, so, yeah, of, cor of course, horses can go into the flow state sometimes more easily than humans who are trying to control and resist things. And so um that's a that's a really important aspect of getting into that flow state and you know i've met so many people who were working on various projects you know whether they're writing a paper or um working on some kind of problem they need to solve and 
finally they just take a break and they go out to the barn and they might be grooming their horse, maybe riding their horse, maybe just sitting quietly with their horse. And all of a sudden being in the horse's presence just causes this alignment in the human that releases new ideas and new information in a, in more of a flow state. It feels very easy. And so Einstein once said that the, the three major places that he got his best ideas were the bed, the bath, and the barn. So it's like, rather than focusing and really pushing through on something, when he would take time off and just relax a little bit and almost it was almost like he would have to forget the problem to solve it later but it's like your your brain and your whole body which has a lot of intelligence and neural cells throughout the whole body by going out and doing something that aligns you and relaxes you but keeps you also in a reasonably alert state um, it's like the problems get solved on their own and then you get these new ideas that seem to come out of nowhere and so I would add a new B to that list. There's the bed, the bath, and the barn. And I also, or, or, and now I would add the barn, the bed, the bath, and the bus, he was saying. That's what it was. And uh, yeah, so I would add the barn to that. And we often engage in our workshops that we do, especially workshops that are more about advanced human development skills, where we're exercising intuition and creativity and leadership. We do actually create opportunities for people to just be with the horses. And in that state, new ideas seem to arise out of nowhere. And, and we don't really know exactly how the horses are doing this, but they they really are like catalysts for inspiration. So, and, and there's myths all over the place that, that do acknowledge that horses have this ability to act as catalysts for inspiration and new insights. Yes, definitely. Yeah, the, the gift of equanimity and um, that might be part of the, the teaching of, of, of the horse. And, uh, and so in, in your workshops, are there specific um, protocols or I don't know, how, how do you think that the horse transmit this, this um, equanimity? Because it's, it's really beyond, beyond words. I mean, it's, it's a concept of, um, it's a concept, a spiritual concept that is beyond beyond words so uh, how is it possible to uh, to to experience that well we do a combination of you know progressive skill building um, with a variety of horse activities that help people become more centered learn how to regulate their own nervous systems in optimal ways and become assertive without being aggressive and also to relax into expanded states of consciousness. There's also um, a metaphor or a myth that the horse has brought to my attention that I've written about in several of my books. And that is the, the idea of twin forms of consciousness. And so this, this is something that we do use very methodically in EponaQuest workshops involving creativity and intuition building is to allow people to access these twin forms of consciousness. This arose because my mare Rasa, who was my primary inspiration, especially in my first book, The Tao of Equus, Rasa had twins and one was, one was, they were both born premature and one was stillborn and one lived. And through that experience of having, um, sitting with the one who lived and we had to bottle feed him and we had to take care of him because he was premature. I began to look up myths of horses and, and myths of twins. And I found out that cross-culturally, there are all kinds of myths involving horses and two and male twins in particular. And in, in these cases, usually one of the male twins dies and goes to the other world, so to speak. And one is alive, but retains connection to his twin in the other world. And so that's really a, a metaphor for the fact that we have both a logical earthly consciousness with a set location in time and space and a very linear biography, but we can also access this other worldly twin, this other form of consciousness that allows us to move back and forth in time and to access um, the memories of horses and people who lived long before we were born. and 
to fly to the stars and change form even. We can even imagine that our twin is changing into a horse, which is one of the activities that we do so that the person has the experience of shifting into a horse consciousness. And this otherworldly spiritual twin, when we have it form a partnership with our logical earthly twin, allows people to do things like journey to other worlds without the use of plant medicines necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of uh, people who are using plant medicines now to create significant shifts in consciousness that lead to healing that has been shown. And there are people who are combining horse work with plant medicines. Um, but we found too that with the with using the myth of the twins, which comes from the horses themselves, we're helping people access that otherworldly twin at will without necessarily having to take plant medicines and go through that um, challenging situation that you have to make sure you have the right facilitator for that. And once you take a plant medicine, you're on that train until it ends. Whereas by using your this like metaphor of the twins and learning how to activate that and journey with that, you can um, shift the experience in any way you want so you don't have to feel like you're taken over by something and so this allows people to bring in mythic forms of imagination and um, innovative forms of imagination that introduce you to new ideas and actually transcend paradoxes that your logical earthly twin can't fathom and a lot of my work that is involves what you, what we would think of as innovative ideas comes first from ha having these mythic associations with the horses and these journeys with horses with the other worldly twin taking charge. Um, and then these mythic insights, eventually there it's like the myth helps to bring these nonverbal insights into a form that then the logical twin can start to work with. And through that, then a lot of times I end up writing sections of my non um, fiction books that seem very logical and straightforward, but the ideas came from this mythic encounter that I had through the work with the horses. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's striking how, how much the, the myth of, of the twins is is um, is connected with with the horses and and even um, among the the Navajo, you are you are almost neighbor to the Navajo nation. Yes, yes. And, um, and and they are more in the the northern part of Arizona, and uh, and they they indeed have a myth with with um, with twins actually, and it's connected with the gift of the gift of the horses to humans. So yeah, it's it's absolutely striking. And, and th there is a form of um, creativity um, that that allows us to enter this realm of non-visible aspect, which is music. Um, I'm a musician myself. Well, it's my hobby. It's not my profession. And um, and I know that actually you you be you began your activity, your life as being a professional musician, is this right? And um, I, I, I've heard that you are now giving concerts with your husband, who is a renowned musician, Steve Roach. So I was, I was kind of wondering, um, in your life, is this parallel tracks that you pursue with, with the, the horse the Epona Quest connection and your musical activity, or is there any interconnection between those two activities? Well, there's a serious interconnection because okay. I, I have a I have a degree in music. I'm I'm a violist, a string player, mm -hmm. and right now I'm actually I've expanded and added an electric five string violin viola that I can plug straight into all kinds of effects for shifting the sound in all these exciting ways. And um, so that's really fun. That that sort of arose because of COVID when we were all shut down from offering workshops, then I had the time to, to learn, to, to relearn this five string electric violin viola that has the range of both. And, um, but actually what's, what's really interesting about this is 
when I was a professional musician and I did play in orchestras and string quartets and I was a radio announcer and producer and put on jazz festivals and all kinds of things like that. Um, one of the things that was is so hard about going through any kind of, especially classical music training is it's so perfectionistic and it has gotten taken over by a lot of elements uh, stressing, you know, competition and making large amounts of money and, you know, and then there's all of these people who are judging you, like, you, you know, it, it's so perfectionistically oriented that it actually stifles your creativity. And, and so many years ago, I was, uh, when I first bought my horse Rasa, I actually ended up selling my viola at that time. And most of my CD collection, I sold th those things in order to buy Rasa. And then when I got my book advance for the Tao of Equus, which is really about my relationship with Rasa and all that she opened up in, in me, I used that book advance to go buy another viola. So there's always this feeling of giving up the music for Rasa, but then reconnecting with the music through Rasa. And by interacting with the horses and, and learning how to dance with the horses on the ground um, and improvising with them and having this really, um, learning how to have a really efficient, highly regu regulated nervous system that expands creativity. All of these things helped me to come back to music to be able to play and compose with much more freedom and enjoyment than I ever have before. And so it was the horses who who allowed me to move beyond this sense of being constrained and caged by the music and its perfectionism into this free flowing, you would say, I mean, really can get into the flow of the music now with all of the things that I learned from interacting with the horses. So Steve and I have for years, I mean, really since the beginning when I was um, doing workshops in the early 2000s even, we would often have um, music making sessions where people who had never made music before get to come together and Steve creates this way that you can play with all these different instruments with with some echo and um, reverb that sounds like you're in a big cathedral and we would also work with people to teach them how to play together um, and so it's really about listening and and having nonverbal conversations with others and we would find that them doing this music piece and then going back in with the horses, then they would have more flow with the horses and then learning the various skills with the horses and, and getting the confidence and the ability to listen to the nonverbal things the horses are offering. Then you go back in and make music and it enhances that. So it's as if the two are actually um, in partnership, music and the horses. Making music can help you have a better relationship with your horse. Spending time with your horse can cause you to have a better relationship with your music or art, opening up creativity on all possible levels. And so these days, Steve and I and one of our colleagues who's a really fine multi-instrumentalist, her name is Serena Gabriel, and um, she has studied Nada Yoga in India. And Nada Yoga means the yoga of sound and about how to open up various spiritual capacities through this yoga of sound. And so we have a workshop that we've done once a year for several years now called um, Nada Brahma. Nada Brahma is a Sanskrit phrase, which means the universe is sound. There are a number of worldwide religions and philosophies and even some scientific indications that the universe is actually was actually jump started by the release of sound and that in some sense the universe is being sung into being um you know the the consciousness that gives rise to the form of the universe is actually often portrayed as as a great sacred sound we even have we have the om of course the sacred sound in um eastern philosophies, but we also have the idea in the Christian and Jew Jewish Bible um, that in the beginning was the word and the word was with the creator and the word was the creator of all things, 
with the idea that it is a sacred sound that is at the root, this vibration that is supporting um, everything moving into sound. And quantum physics has shown that what we're really dealing with is not so much solid matter as vibration that takes on form. So even science is now um, being able to confirm this. So when we do a workshop called Not a Brahma, we have people who are musicians who are in the same state I was. They feel, you know, like they've they've hit a wall. They they feel like their creativity has been shut down by this, um, you know, sort of cult of perfectionism and um, evaluation, rather than allowing people to create freely and to really connect with their souls and their spirit and their own, you know, life force that is often put in a cage by people who say that unless you are the best musician in the world, you don't deserve to even make music. And so those people come and they find a freeing of their creativity. And a lot of that happens through these activities we do with horses during this workshop. And uh, then we also have horse people coming to the Nada Brahma workshop to expand their creativity and, and they are really fine horse people, but they find that these um, activities we have where we're making music and helping people come together and expand their creativity actually goes back and helps them with their relationship with their horses. So for me, music and horses have always been connected. I just haven't had much of a forum for talking about it in my books. I've talked about it a little bit, but it's actually been active in my practice um, again, since I, I first started doing workshops in the early 2000s. Thank you, Lina. So that's absolutely beautiful. And actually, I um, facilitated a workshop with a handpan player, and it was absolutely amazing because the horses could, reacted to the, the, the sounds, and they, they almost if they understood the, the, the sense of music and the, and the vibration. So yeah, definitely something to um, maybe to explore a little bit. And there is also this sense of perfection in the classical um, writing where everything That's has to true. be, you know, so. Mm, and um, so thank you, thank you about that. And I understand it's a lot interconnected. <laughs> and, um, and on another subject, um, there, there is um, well, I was um, I usually ride bareback, and um, and I sometimes um, I, I ride freely in nature. I'm lucky enough that I, I don't have to be in a, in a barn. Actually, I'm in, in nature, and um, in this you know galloping in um, in nature, there is a sense of of something almost um, mythologic. And um, in many myths, the, the horse is connected with the, the big heroes. And um, you were talking about the, the hero twins. And, um, but also the, the great uh, figures, uh, Winston Churchill, George Washington, even Ronald Reagan in the, in the US were, um, very, were very good writers. And um, so I, I had, it's not really a question, but in the conversation, I was wondering what what is your opinion about this heroism connected with with the horse? And I know that you talk about emotional heroism in the Epona Quest um, uh, teachings, but in a more in a more general um, range about heroism and and this connection with with the horse. And uh, so I'm sorry, it's it's a, maybe not a very clear question. It's not a question anyway, but I was wondering your, your thoughts about, about that, actually. Yeah, it's a great topic of discussion, for sure. And you said it very well. Um, yes, I think you do really have to step up and really be in your power to be effective with horses, but it has to be a power that's not aggressive and so you really learn a, a form of balanced power and assertiveness when you're with horses. And I also realized that, um, you know, 
when you have when you're taking a horse into war, let's say, because a lot of these early figures were actually riding horses into war situations. Yeah. It's insane, really, that a horse would even go into war because to to ride into war the horse himself or herself has to be heroic because it goes against all of their instincts as what we might call a prey animal an animal who can be preyed on in nature to go anywhere near the scent of blood let alone the absolute chaos and i mean horses on battlefields were screaming people don't realize that um this is horrific these are horrific situations for horses and so anybody who's going to ride a horse into battle has to have a relationship with that horse that um, moves beyond instinct. Because if you if you beat a horse into submission, that horse is going to dump you when the first sign of conflict um, shows up, you yeah. know. And so people like George Washington, Alexander the Great was an exceptional horseman. The Buddha was an exceptional horseman. And what you see, um, and you can read this in The Power of the Herd about that, um, that section about the Buddha, as well as George Washington and some of these other figures. But what you see is really talented horse trainers um, were bringing forward a form of power that was engaged in relationship and connection with this animal that they had to trust in in war situations. And... Um, you see a lot of the Buddha's mindfulness techniques are really relevant and seem to even have grown out of the Buddha's own experiences being an exceptional horse trainer and rider. Horses, it's like they're exercising all of these qualities that you need to be a highly functional human. And hopefully we're going to get beyond the idea of war as a way to illustrate this. But when you, we're talking about heroism of these early figures, Alexander the Great, George Washington, Winston Churchill, they all rode their horses in war settings. So that's why I have to bring it up. But that's where you really get to see what kind of a relationship you have to have with a horse to get it to override its instincts and go into a possibly deadly situation. And with Alexander the Great, his horse, Bucephalus, um, also saved his life a number of times and so they were they were really heroic together so the horse is as heroic as the human in those situations maybe even more so but um in terms of everyday life um, for us to step up and begin to learn how to be mindful and connected to another being but also being in our power at the same time these are things that are often thought of as paradoxes or opposites but the horses have a way of tuning us into bringing all of the best qualities of these elements together. And so I had to be ex incredibly heroic to work with um, my stallion, Midnight Merlin. He was a stallion that had been abused and he was extremely aggressive. And just to go in there on a daily basis, just to, just to even stand with him quietly was in some sense taking my life into my own hands. And what I had to learn to do was to regulate my own nervous system in his presence, even though he was threatening me and scaring me. And so he became like a, a mindfulness teacher, a meditation teacher on some level to me. Um, because also what I learned was I had to use my own nervous system to co-regulate Merlin's out of control nervous system. And I had to sense you know, at a distance of maybe I was standing five feet away from him, I could actually sense and feel in my own body when he was thinking about becoming nervous about something and either running off or attacking me. And if I could sense that shift in my nervous system and shift my nervous system in a more productive, connected way, I could cause Merlin to avoid going into a flight or fight mode. And I thought, well, this is a high level of mindfulness skills that I'm learning from this horse. I wouldn't have learned it in any other capacity other than to have that horse basically tune my nervous system to be able to help him become more centered and balanced and move beyond his trauma. So I learned all kinds of things with Merlin, but to even walk in there was not just emotional heroism. There was a high level of physical heroism I had to have. Thank you about heroism and um, 
And maybe the my my last question is um, is about the well, let's say undergoing situation both in the U.S. and uh, I don't know if the future president of the of the USA is um, is a um, is a writer. I, I would doubt it anyway. And um, no, he's not. I don't even think he owns a cat or a dog. <laughs> So he's not, he's not an animal person. No, I, I don't think so. And there is all this war going on in Ukraine, in a lot of parts in, in the world, and, and probably these uh, skills of, um, of, um, of staying calm and these heroic um, skills of mindfulness will be helpful in the future. But what would you say that the, the horse would teach us um, in the future? In, and how do you think they, they can heal us? And how do you think they, they um, intend to heal us in, in the future in this um, maybe a little bit difficult uh, situation that we are living now? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? That's um, a really big question. Sure. <laughs> I mean, really, I wish there was a really simple answer to it because if there was, it would be so useful right now. Yes. But um, yes. basically, you know, I do see that a lot of people who feel disempowered um, are allowing themselves to be um, influenced in all kinds of ways that are, are not helpful um, for their own best interest. Um, and there's a tendency of some people to want to follow whatever leader they feel is most um, in alignment with their, their social system. And if people could actually be more heroic themselves, more centered themselves, uh, more mindful in themselves, they would not be so easily swayed by various leaders who may not have their best interests at heart. But it, uh, I see a lot of people just giving up their power and just wanting to follow someone who's going to take care of them. And one of the things that uh, that you know somebody like Trump, for instance, will say uh, he says a lot of things, but one of the things he will often say consistently is, "I'm the only one who can take care of you. I'm the only one who can lead you to a better life. I'm the only one who can lead you to this." And he even said things like. You know, I'm going to keep women safe, whether they like it or not. Yes. And um, he's rather, rather aggressive that way. But there are a lot of people who want that feeling of strength in their life. Um, but if they could develop it themselves with their own ability to be creative and expand our idea of what what is possible for humanity rather than all the old patterns, because people are going back and forth right now in the U.S. by saying, you know, um, one side is it's all about capitalism and the other side is the other option is communism. And that's not true. Um, there is not, there's, there's many, many other options. And if we have the ability to stand together and learn how to share power as we are in our own power, but be mutually respectful and mutually uplifting and be mindful and then also be able to get into those highly regulated flow states where we can expand and think more clearly and creatively, then we have a chance to, to move forward together into a new era of humanity's position. That's not gonna happen until people are more heroic, more powerful and more mindful. And the horses are the place to go to learn how to put all of those pieces together. And they're there to help us do that. Well, thank you, Linda. You know, we definitely need more, well, to be conscious of our own power. And, and the horse is a fantastic teacher about this. And so, Linda, um, a big thank you for this interview. Thank Maybe you so a few much. words about your actuality and, um, and what you are proposing now. Um, I know you were doing a workshop with the connection focus therapy and, um, well, um, anything about your activity and um, uh, I remember that there was an, another book or film maybe that, that were going to be made um, well 
I'm uh, I'm still doing workshops and um, they cover a variety of topics, everything from leadership and emotional heroism to um, sentient communication skills, learning nonverbal communication skills, how to use your own nervous system to help regulate and stabilize others is a part of that. And that's something the horses teach very well. Also expanding creativity and intuition and in workshops like Black Horse Wisdom. And so we have a wide variety of workshops going on. And also I'm, I'm doing a lot of work lately um, with my online courses, which are highly produced. And you've been a great champion of the online courses. And one of the exciting things that's happening is that there are a number of social service agencies and, and businesses in the US and Canada that they don't necessarily have, they have not necessarily convinced people to go out to the barn so much for activities. And it's really, you know, if you have several hundred people on your staff, it's hard to get them all out to the barn. And what I found is that by taking them through the online courses in a directive and progressive way, with they're, they're making incredible progress. And we're actually doing studies to show that the horse wisdom that I've distilled into the online courses is highly effective in teaching people leadership and emotional and social intelligence skills in a fun and engaging way. And with some of the groups, I also have them be, be able to come out and do like monthly trips to the barn. And sometimes I actually, I have a new contract in Canada now with a group of um, managers from nursing homes in Alberta, Canada. We have 50 of them going through the online program. And then I'm going to go up there and do an indoor workshop up there without the horses. And this is actually becoming very effective. So not everybody can afford to or feels like they're ready to go to the barn. And so what I'm finding is being able to distill this horse wisdom and present it in a way that's engaging is kind of the next level of expanding the horse work beyond the people who are already interested in horses. We, Right now, we're doing a great job of drawing people in who instinctually love horses and want to be with horses. But to take the horse work and the horse wisdom to people who don't who've never thought about horses before, may even be for afraid of horses, but are still recognizing that they can learn from the horses. I think this is the next wave of expansion of horse wisdom through the world. Well, Linda, thank you very much for this interview. And, um, and of course, we can find all those activities on your website. It's uh, eponaquest.com, uh, I think. And also in France with a lot of um, um, workshop in, in with the, the French Hipponoquest Association. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lamaz. It was a pleasure. Pleasure was for me. Bye bye. Je voulais aussi vous donner des éléments pratiques pour ce sommet en ligne. Donc c'est un sommet qui est gratuit sur simple inscription comme membre de la communauté Cheval en Conscience. Vous avez le lien juste en dessous. On, une communauté où il y a déjà plus de 1500 membres et donc vous avez la possibilité de regarder gratuitement les interviews le jour de leur diffusion ou alors euh, si vous voulez les regarder plus confortablement au moment où vous le voulez vous avez la possibilité d'acheter un pack replay donc pack replay pour le montant de 97 euros vous avez accès à plus d'une trentaine d'interviews plus de, de 35 heures d'interviews sur les chevaux médiateurs, sur les chevaux guérisseurs, avec des témoignages exclusifs de la part des nations amérindiennes, de, de, du chamanisme, on a interviewé donc cette chamane de, de Sibérie, et également des professionnels du cheval en France qui parlent de leur métier, comment est-ce que le cheval peut être intégré dans des pratiques de psychologie, euh, comment il peut être intégré avec la théorie polyvagale, donc tout ça, vous avez la possibilité d'acheter un pack replay pour regarder confortablement les interviews. Et je voulais aussi vous dire qu'une part des bénéfices de la vente de ces packs replay sera reversée à l'association Equi Dolce. C'est une association qui est vraiment, vraiment chouette, vraiment un, un beau travail de cette association qui crée un refuge pour les chevaux. Et on a vraiment à cœur de soutenir 
de d'aider cette association Equidolce avec euh, Cheval en Conscience. Euh, Inscrivez-vous, c'est gratuit, n'hésitez pas et vous aurez accès gratuitement à toutes nos interviews. Voilà les amis, à bientôt